Okay, so by this point in time, Lindsay doesn't need much of an introduction, um, uh, but I will kind of point out that the last couple of things that she's been t teaching, have been, she's been doing it as an incredible favor to us, because there's stuff that, uh, that she doesn't normally do. So, uh, right now, she'll tell you a little bit about what she is normally doing and working on, and what I think, and, and what she thinks, spends her time thinking about, um, is struggling with and banging her head against the wall, I guess. I'm uh, <laughs> mostly just struggling. <laughs> but, yeah, I think, I think, uh, so you may right off the bat notice uh, that this says 3 p.m. and it is not in fact 3 p.m. But uh, Brian and I decided that we would shuffle up our DIA sections a little bit because while I'll be presenting and what I've been working on um, for my thesis dovetails really nicely following along after what Brian's been talking about. Um, so the three things I really hope that you walk away with uh, from this short talk is being able to tell what the differences and similarities are between a targeted assay development and a DIA-based assay development. So SRM or PRM assay development versus a DIA assay development. Um, I'd like you to gain a little bit more familiarity with a quantitative DIA assay uh, development pipeline. So what we were just doing with Brian um, and the Walnut uh, tutorial was more just detecting, right? And then we dumped it into Skyline. Now what? <laughs> um, and the, the last thing I hope you're able to do is assess when a targeted quantitative assay is more appropriate than a DIA and when a DIA assay is more appropriate than a targeted. Um, a couple days ago on, on Tuesday, you guys woke up bright and early for uh, Sandy's talk on how to build prior knowledge for targeted proteomics. And if this feels a little deja vu, it's because this is going to follow a similar vein as that talk. Um, and one of the things she tried to emphasize was that targeted assays you're establishing knowledge before you go off and acquire your data. You're building and refining your method, um, starting with a specific hypothesis or a list of proteins that your boss tells you he's interested in, um, generating a list um, of the peptides, perhaps with like an in silico digest or by doing a database search. And then you go through these rounds and rounds of refining peptides and refining transitions to make sure they're detectable, their chromatogram shape looks good, they're unique to the peptide you're interested in, you do all these validation steps, and Andy Hoofnagel's been talking a lot about how to, how to calibrate and validate your assays. And then finally, at the end of all of this, this blood, sweat, and tears, you end up with a final assay with a list of targets that you believe in, and you can start acquiring data. So thinking back a little farther, Mike had introduced you on Monday in this intro to how, what, uh, how you, the steps of doing this might differ between having 50 peptides in your assay versus having over a thousand peptides in your assay. So we're finally going to answer the second half of this question today on Thursday afternoon. How can we design an approach to calibrate a method with thousands and thousands of peptides? And it comes down to the idea of how well do you know DIA peptides? So with Brian, we just detected all of these peptides, but how well do we really know them, right? They're not a, a close group of friends and colleagues that we've been working with and refining and developing relationships with over the course of assay development. Instead, we've just walked into CenturyLink with, you know, thousands of our apparently best friends that we share something in common with, I guess, but we don't actually know anyone in that stadium. So how can we get to know everyone in town um, using DIA? And the biggest difference that Jarrett was telling you about, to put it into context um, with the beginning of this DIA-centric day, is that DIA assays are establishing knowledge after we've acquired the data. So targeted, we spend all this time refining our list of peptides to get to a, a, a compiled assay list um, and with DIA, we're acquiring all our data and then trying to filter things down. So this is what I've been thinking about a lot in my thesis research is how can we come up with calibrated, validated peptides from DIA that'll give us good, solid, uh, reproducible, quantitative results. So I'm going to walk through this um, together with you. And just so that you can kind of put this into context in your mind, imagine, for example, this walnut tutorial we've just done you have this list of peptides, 
maybe they're okay. <laughs> maybe they're bad. Do you want to go through and check every single one? Um, you could, how we used to do it. But I'm trying to come up with ways that we could do it a little bit faster. So with the SRM and PRM assay development, just to refresh your memory, um, we're actually going to be doing a lot of the same steps with a DIA assay development for quantitative um, uh, peptide measures, but we're going to start off having all of this data instead of getting to the end of our assay refinement and then collecting our data. So let's jump in and let's start to get a little bit more familiar with a quantitative DIA assay development. So the first step is what we just did. Congratulations, you're already on your way. Um, we've already started off with a list of everything that was detected in our sample. So with this walnut tutorial, we kind of walked away with having 74 something proteins, a couple hundred peptides, thousands of transitions. And this is, this is small, this is small data, right? Um, Brian already kind of refined our list so that we were only looking at a set of proteins for a pathway. You can imagine how big this list gets if you're looking at everything, for example, in the human proteome. So what we do next um, and what uh, Brian started showing you is how to refine the peptides for uniqueness and how to threshold the number of transitions for a minimum number. So what you did first Remember in Skyline, we went to edit, we went to refine, we went to the advanced settings. And for quantitative, I like to do things a little bit stricter than, than Brian does. So I, <laughs> I have standards. Um, <laughs> I set a threshold of a minimum of three transitions per precursor, not just including precursors, but a minimum of three transitions per precursor. And I also set a threshold for a minimum number of peptides per protein. If I have just one peptide per protein, that's generally considered a sketchy practice in most quantitative assays. So I, I threshold at two, a minimum of two peptides per, per protein. And I also check this box that says remove duplicate peptides. Since we were just working in this window, you might have noticed these two checkboxes right next to each other, remove repeated peptides and remove duplicate peptides. Kind of sounds like a repeated checkbox option, but they're actually different. So the remove repeated peptides will leave the first instance of a non-unique peptide in your Skyline document. So you can imagine if you have two proteins that share the same triptych peptide, remove repeated peptides would only remove one instance of that peptide and leave it in the first protein. So I like to be very strict. My standards are very high. So I remove any duplicate peptides, so all of my peptides are unique. So right away, this is taking care of um, some of the most basic filter thresholds for what a quantitative peptide is. For detected, it's not a problem. You don't have to worry about that. But for quantitation, we want to make sure we have a minimum number of transitions and a minimum number of peptides per protein. So now we start uh, thinking about robustness, and this is kind of where, where Andy Hofnagel's talks start to come in. How do we calibrate a signal to a quantitative value? So one way we can do this in Skyline is using Skyline's native coefficient of variation, coefficient of variation um, settings. So in Skyline, uh, you've seen this peak area pane down here. If I zoom into just that peak area pane, there's an option called group by, and we can group by sample group. And then if I go to the transitions and use their total, I get a chart that looks something like this. So I want to orient you to what this plot is showing. So on the x-axis, I have 14 sample groups, and each sample group had a triplicate measure. So I have 14 times three files in Skyline, and each one of these bars represents three replicates that I took for that sample group. On the y-axis is the peak area CV as a percentage. This is, this is how reproducible that peak shape and peak area is. So if the peaks look the exact same every single time across all three of those replicates, I would have an extremely low CV. If it's extremely high CV, it means the peak area is varied a lot between the three replicates. And what you'd want to do is, is look for a percent CV 
typically that's less than 20%. You would want it to be less than 20%, and that would indicate to us that this peptide is very reproducible. So I've noticed in analyzing DIA data that DIA methods are pretty reproducible at measuring peptides. And this is one of the, the big benefits of using DIA over some of the other acquisition methods is that when you're using DIA, you're getting not a stochastic measure of the peptides, you're getting a very uh, systematic measure of the peptides. So what I'm showing here is um, a cumulative density plot that's showing for each percent of CV, so starting at 0% CV, and I've got 20% CV marked with a red line because that would be our cutoff. How many peptides have that level of CV or lower? So this plot is showing for 20% CV, I have, uh, what, 23,000 peptides that are reproducible to 20% CV standards. The median percent CV in a DA method looks like it's about 8%, and this is a number I've seen uh, from other researchers, from other labs too, doing this type of, of analysis. Um, and there's, there's the majority of targets um, are reproducible. So what are some of the reasons a target might not be reproducible? Why it, might its peak area not be the same across every single measurement I take of it? Degradation. It could be sticking to the plastic, it could be modifying, um, and that would be reducing uh, the, the peak area. Um, it could be uh, a, an unstable chromatogram shape. It might not uh, have a good chromatography profile. Um, maybe the peak is very early or a very late eluder, um, so the peak shape isn't very reproducible between runs. Um, and those would be peptides that aren't particularly quantitative. Those would be peptides that if I measure it once and then I measure it the next day, even though the actual value should be the same, my mass spectrometer gave me different values for it. So I wouldn't want to include that 17% that of targets that are not reproducible. So now that I have a list of peptides that are maybe reproducible in my data, um, we get to the, the validation level of quantitative assay development. Um, and this is where I wanna really make sure you guys understand how validations typically work. So hopefully we've, we've really emphasized this and hammered this home that the mass spectrometer, the signal from a mass spectrometer is not inherently quantitative. Um, Brendan had quizzed you earlier, what, what even is the intensity from a mass spectrometer? You might remember him quizzing you on that. What is the intensity even mean? <laughs> so, so there we go. Excellent. So it sounds like everyone's got this pretty well memorized at this point. And really the, the take home message is it's not inherently quantitative. So a lot of, um, a lot of us might, might look at two peak areas and say, yeah, those peak areas are different. But how do we turn these peak areas into absolute abundances, absolute quantitative values? And the answer to this that Andy kept repeating over and over yesterday is calibrate and validate. You have to calibrate and validate these signals to something that we know. And he was saying even a single point calibration is better than no calibration. And I think, because I prefer quantitative analyses, that quantitative analysis is the ultimate goal of, of doing DIA. And most of what we're doing so far is a targeted analysis where we just say, I have a set number of proteins that I'm interested in, and those are the only ones I'm gonna look at, even though there's so many more that I could be analyzing in my sample. And we have to remember that this signal, even at a targeted level, is not calibrated or valid validated. Right? Even if we're doing a targeted analysis of DIA, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, dismiss us from having to calibrate and validate. We still do. No matter how big your assay is, how limited or broad our analysis of DIA data is, if it's going to be quantitated, we still have to calibrate and validate. And that brings us to, to the cornerstone uh, of my life and my research, which is a calibration curve. Calibration curve, on the x-axis, you have a known quantity, something you absolutely know. It could be a spike in amount. It could be the number of cells on your column. It could be the number of brains out of a mouse. 
Um, and on the Y, we'll have measured signals. This is what we're getting out of the mass spectrometer. The first thing we want is for the data to be reproducible. If I were to measure a known quantity multiple times, I want the value I get out of the mass spectrometer to be the same. So that's what we were just looking at before with percent CV. That's a quick and easy way to filter for things that are not reproducible. CV will be low if these dots are clustered very closely together, and CV will be high if the values are dispersed or spread out. The second thing we want from our signal from a peptide is for it to be linear. For a known amount, if we double a known amount, we want the signal to double too. If we add 10 times the known amount from a sample, we want the signal to be 10 times as high. When we do this in a mass spectrometer though, it's not just a straight, straight line going through zero, right? Mass spectrometers have this noise threshold. There's some, some level uh, below which we always get some signal. So the canonical shape of a calibration curve typically looks kind of like a hockey stick, where as the signal is decreasing, as our known quantity is decreasing and our measured signal is decreasing linearly, we eventually hit a point, a plateau of the noise. And that allows us to determine what the limit of detection and the limit of quantitation is. So these are words I think that we've mentioned to you before um, in this class, but maybe you didn't quite appreciate what exactly they were. And I want to emphasize the limit of detection versus the limit of quantitation. So limit of detection would be, I am pretty certain I detected this, right? And the limit of quantitation is, I'm pretty confident that I quantified this, that I measured it. So I detected it versus I, versus I measured it. And I'll note, just because we were just doing Walnut um, tutorial, that the limit of detection is not whether or not I detected it. So I'll let you uh, get confused by that for a second, right? <laughs> So we want to determine reproducible, linear, and validated peptides using this calibration curve, pretty standard analytical chemistry. For the majority of targeted proteomics, when we're going to do this, we put together a calibration curve in a representative matrix using synthesized peptides. Because we only have tens, maybe hundreds of targets, so we synthesize the peptides and we put into the matrix of whatever we're doing. If I'm doing heart tissue, I'll have a heart tissue lysate. If I'm using yeast, I'll have a yeast lysate. If I'm doing plasma, it'll be a pooled plasma, something that represents the complexity of the matrix I usually work in. And then I'll add a high concentration of the peptides I'm targeting and dilute down to a sample that has no concentration of my synthesized peptides. So I know how much synthesized peptides are in each one of these tubes, I can make my calibration curve. Any questions so far? Because I'm going to change gears a little. Calibration curve's good? Yes? For a calibration curve, yep. Yeah, that's what you would do for SRM or PRM. You would run the same method you would normally do, and you would run each one of these samples starting with the blank and moving up, not randomizing, which is exactly the opposite of what Olga just told you, right? Like Olga just told you randomize block everything. So you'll run from the blank up. And the reason for this is carryover of your synthetic standards. You want to avoid any carryover. So I'd run my, bl my blank and then I'd run each one of these. And then maybe I would run like a QC. And then I'd run my blank, each one of these and do maybe triplicates for a curve like this. Any more questions before I switch gears? So now the question is, that's how we can do it with targeted, where we only have tens to hundreds of peptides, and it's maybe expensive, but not prohibitively if we really care about our targets. How can we do it with DIA, where we have hundreds, uh, thousands to tens of thousands of targets? I'm certainly not going to get a grant to pay for that many synthetic peptides. So how can I do this? And my research so far has been focusing on making curves without synthetic peptides, making curves for entire proteomes to find on the entire proteome level which targets are quantitative. So what I've been doing is I've been using, for example, a proteome of interest. In me, I'm doing every 
uh, everyone want, every one of my experiments in yeast, so my proteome of interest is the yeast proteome. And then finding uh, an appropriate background proteome to dilute my proteome into. This is a little confusing. So what do I mean by an appropriate background proteome? Two things. The background proteome needs to be similar chromatographic complexity. So it would be inappropriate to match a yeast proteome with water. That is nowhere near as chromatographically complex. It would also be equally inappropriate to dilute my yeast in a background proteome of HeLa. That's way more complex than a yeast proteome. So you'd want to match whatever your proteome is with a background proteome of appropriate complexity. I would make a standard curve the same way I would make a curve using synthetic isotope standards. And then the catch would be, instead of having a ratio of endogenous peptide light signal to a heavy signal, instead of using a ratio of light to heavy, I'd be using a label-free area. So I want to put a big warning here, right? Because this is, we're in uncharted territories at this point. This is academic, ongoing, active research, right? Um, it is not by any means the only way that you could do this, but this is the way we are doing it in our lab. So you would first choose your appropriate background proteome. You would dilute it in. So some examples, uh, what I've been doing is I've been using yeast in a heavy labeled yeast proteome and not using the peak area ratio, just using the heavy labeled yeast to be an exact chromatographic complexity. Um, but you can imagine maybe pairing a, a, a Cerevisiae strain with a Picchia strain, something diverged enough but still similar complexity in the proteome level. Um, there's uh, Sandy in the lab has been trying uh, this concept um, using human plasma with chicken plasma, something that should be about similar chromatographic complexity, but diverged enough um, to be different. Fish blood. The other day. Fish blood? Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I acquire, uh, so the question I had just gotten earlier was, do you acquire this with your regular method? I, re I acquire this with my regular method, and my method of choice for DIA uh, surveys 400 to 1,000 MZ precursors. So I acquire from my blank, which is 100% background proteome, all the way up to 100% of my analyte proteome. And then I acquire again, and then I acquire a third time. So three replicates of this curve. And then I can use, for example, the undiluted proteome of interest. I can measure that over several days because it took several several days to acquire all of this data on a two-hour gradient. I can compare those peak area CVs to see which one of the peptides in the yeast proteome is stable, is robust. And then because this is a curve, I can construct calibration curves. I can model calibration curves from this. So just to, to show you a little bit, if the undiluted proteome of interest represents a 100% signal, then when I dilute it by half, I should get about half of the signal. And when I dilute it by a tenth, I should get a tenth of the signal. So these curves are giving us the same uh, output we should expect. If we expect a tenth of the output, that's what we're getting in our peak area. And when we visualize as a bar chart, we can see these are very reproducible measures, and they also follow a canonical calibration curve shape. I use MS stats. We didn't get to this part of the tutorial, but you have all of the, the tools in your tutorial folder to do these yourself, too, using MS stats in R. I construct calibration curves from these, and I get a distribution of what the LOQs are, and it's kind of interesting. So I have peptides whose LOQs are way too high to even register. So this bar is, the, the yellow cues are extremely high. And there's a lot of reasons for this, right? In my calibration curve, I'm limited by the endogenous abundance of the proteins. So if it's a low abundant protein, I could detect it, but maybe I can't quantify it very reliably. And so that's, that's why this bar ends up looking so high. But of the other limits of quant that I get, they kind of follow a normal distribution like you might expect from a whole proteome. So a whole proteome, there's a few proteins that are highly abundant. There's a lot of proteins that are middle abundance. And then there's 
a couple proteins that are low abundance. And I think an important take home is what I've been finding so far in my research that only a third to a half of all the peptides we detected are, are, they're not good quantitative targets. This makes complete sense. We already knew up to this point that not everything you detect can be quantified. And so what I'm doing now is just trying to put numbers on just how much of what we detect is actually quantitative. And it's looking like maybe, maybe a half of the things that we're detecting are actually quantitative. Yes. No, even with an internal standard, I would still say only half to two thirds of the proteins you detect are going to be quantifiable, even with an internal standard. Yeah, because the internal. You can, you can detect any internal standard you spike in, but the endogenous level, which is not the internal standard you spike in, that's an external thing. The, the actual endogenous level of the peptide um, is still limited by biology what's, and the dynamic range of the instrument. Yeah. Yeah. So I've I've I don't think I have the slide in here, but looking at the distribution of the data, um, I do not see a U-shaped curve, but I'm also using some of these, these peak uh, boundary tools that are being developed um, by, by Brian and other members in the lab, right? Um, so this is, this is pretty uh, unusual for me to see an instance where um, the boundaries over which I'm integrating start including transitions that are not there. More often, I actually see the background values going to zero. No. Nope. Nope. It is just a diluent. Yep. So the last point I'm hoping you can take home is when it's uh, appropriate to use a targeted versus a DIA assay, um, because I think we spent a lot of time today singing the praises of DIA. Um, but hopefully, hopefully, um, it's, it's being taken with a grain of salt, right? Um, because we're throwing out all these words like, oh, make sure you refine and that it's quantitative and that you validate and that it's detectable. And, and DIA is a very powerful tool and it's still a little bit of the wild west, right? Like we haven't, we haven't entirely come up with what should be the standards, um, that we use for this. Um, so I would say... If there's a specific goal in mind for your targeted assay, targeted assays are still the best bet. Don't just resort to DIA because it's the new cool thing to do. There is still 100% a place for targeted assays. Um, another thing I'd like to emphasize is that when you're building knowledge like this, whether it's for targeted or for DIA, you absolutely can and should be eliminating candidate targets. Um, nothing that you initially consider is guaranteed to make it past all of the filtering criteria that you put in place for a validated, calibrated assay development. Um, this is an example from uh, one of Andy Hufnagel's recent papers. Um, they started out with 48 potential peptides and ended up with seven. Um, Sandy showed you an example that started with 30 something peptides and she kept eliminating more and more at each step of refinement. So you absolutely should be eliminating peptides if you're performing quantitative assay development. Um, so all this work from my two thesis labs and especially Olga who unfortunately had to go, um, it's been an interesting uh, <laughs> journey.
Um, I added at the end of these slides a whole bunch of extra information for you if any of this piqued your interest um, and you wanted to learn more. And I'll take any questions. I went a little over. Yes? If you have like six dollars on each of six dollars, and you have one transition, which is only good quality data, will you consider using only one transition and go down from your lower limit of participation? So I always use at least three trans transitions and use the sum of those three transitions. So that one transition still being present in my blank would tell me it's noise. It's not truly coming from my peptide. And that would contribute to that hockey stick shape, that noise plateau. So it would be accounted for. It would technically be interfered with because it's still present in my blank. But I would be taking that into consideration when I model the calibration curve. And Yeah, so MS, MS Stats doesn't use that metric for calculating LOD and LOQ. Um, I didn't quite get to it, but they have a pretty sophisticated statistical model to do that if you'd like to talk about it offline. Any other questions? Did I scare you too much? <laughs> Is this scary? 